Good morning. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. If you were doing what I was doing for all these years, you would have left earlier, I think. <laughs> well, uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, and happy 100 years anniversary uh, to Ricardo. And I hope the next 100 years will even bring more innovation and more technology. Uh, I'm also delighted to be in a panel with all women. There's nothing wrong with the men, please don't get me wrong, but it's, uh, it's, it's my first after all these years uh, working in the transportation sector and other areas. So since I left the government uh, two years ago, I have been serving on a number of boards, eight, ten different boards, but I have been spending most of my time uh, writing a book. Uh, and it, and, and as you heard, I would like you to, when you leave here, to go out and all pre-order it. It's called Driving the Future, uh, How to Combat Climate Change with Cleaner, Smarter Cars, and it's going to be published on April 7. So the last two years, I had the chance to break away from the politics of Washington um, of 32 years and uh, the regulatory treadmill, and had the opportunity to reflect the past, the present, and the future of transportation and air quality. It, and it also has allowed me uh, a chance to reflect to one of the most important environmental and economic challenges that our planet is facing, climate change. As you know, transportation in the U.S. is responsible for about one-third of the greenhouse gas emissions, globally about a quarter. And actually, the transportation sector globally is the fastest growing segment in, in, in our society. So my book and my talk today are about how we got here today with cleaner, uh, more efficient, uh, lower carbon fuels, and how science, innovation, smart policies, smart regulations, but also social trends are likely to shape the car of the future. You know, over the past three decades, the dangers of climate change have become clear and immediate. Here in Detroit, the last two winters have been actually pretty cold but globally, 2014 was the warmest year on the record. And each of the last two decades have been warmer than any pre previous decade since we're keeping records, 1850. So now some of the dire effects of climate change are beginning to play out. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, ocean levels have been rising so rapidly that the island nation of Kiribati, it's a small island, is actually buying real estate in other countries. This is a contingency plan. Once their homeland disappears, the gutters of Miami South Beach are increasing inundated with seawater. In New York City, my oldest daughter lives in New York City and she owns real estate and she's very concerned about that. So that makes it more personal. Uh, the city is seriously considering of constructing barriers over 20 feet tall uh, to basically slow down the flooding for the most vulnerable parts of the city. Uh, if you have an oceanfront property and you're trying to get insurance these days, I can tell you it's going to be almost impossible. So unless we take steps to address climate change, we will even face more catastrophic impacts. For three decades, despite the fact that we understood more and more about the science of climate change, there has been political inaction in our country. And I believe in large part, it's because a number of industries, including the oil industry, automobile industry, coal and power generation, took a page from the tactics used by the tobacco industry. I'm very familiar about that because I was in charge of the office at EPA that uh, developed the first tobacco, the second head smoke report. So I know the tactics of the tobacco industry. When I see what the industry is doing is for climate change, it's exactly the same. The other, the other factor is the same industries have undertaken efforts to scare the public about the economic cost of action. So, you know, it's very often in my 30 years of experience at EPA, it's very often companies fight tooth and nail against every major regulation that EPA proposes. One of the agency's first battles was implementing the Clean Air Act um, requirements in 1970 that require 90% reductions of NOx and CO from new cars. And wanting to avoid the regulation, major automobile companies came to DC in 1973 to explain how costly the Clean Air Act would be. For example, 
General Motors, and I'm not picking up on GM, just, to, just as an example, claimed meeting the new standards would create an quote, complete stoppage of the entire GM production, quote, a business catastrophe. Well, the first administrator of EPA, a, a very wise man, um, uh, Mr. Actor House held strong, and the requirements went to effect. So you wonder what happened. Well, rather than destroying the auto industry, these first regulations led the industry to create a catalytic converter, made the American business world leaders in clean car technology, and in 1990, when pretty much every car in the US had a catalytic co converter, very few did in Europe, and today it's hard to find a car in the planet without a catalytic converter. And companies, um, like Corning, and I see my colleague here, Tim, uh, have worked very hard to develop those, those devices. And what Tim tells me is that on an annual basis, we're saving 1.5 million premature deaths by having this device in place. So today, cars are 99% cleaner, but along with that has come a whole slew of innovation that, that we don't remember. Setting aside the catalytic converters, a lot of electronic control systems were introduced because of, of, this, of regulations. Onboard diagnostic systems, among others, that make cars not just cleaner, but lasting longer and more efficient. And without the EPA rules, just think, many of our cities will be facing the same pollution that Beijing and other major cities in developing countries are facing today. And in the meantime, as we did all these regulations, not just on cars, on power plants, uh, clean water, our country has tre enjoyed tremendous economic growth. So my message is you can have smart policies and smart regulations, and at the same time, you can allow economic growth in a country. But now we're facing another environmental ch challenge, another type of pollution. Uh, the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as a result of burning fossil fuels. And as in the past, we need to address this environmental challenge with smart policies, smart regulations, and innovation. So if you recently bought a car, very likely the car you bought will probably is going to be much more efficient and cleaner than the car that you bought five years ago. And by 2025, the average new car on the road will get 54.5 miles per gallon, which is a, in cafe space, for the ones that understand cafe, and it will emit half of the carbon pollution of, of the 2010 cars. Now, this is a huge saving in fuels, huge saving in carbon emissions, and at the same time, it does bring economic benefits to the country, but also the consumer. And it is the result of smart regulations, but also a historic partnership between the auto industry the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Transportation, and the state of California. And like a lot of things in Washington, it has had a very long, sometimes torturous, and very winding journey. Uh, in 2009, two weeks um, after President Obama took office, he brought us to the White House, and he signed two executive orders that led the first climate action in the US in 2010. And there are three main drivers that made this possible. First, the 2007 Supreme Court decision uh, that told the Environmental Protection Agency that greenhouse gases are considered pollutants under the existing law, the Clean Air Act, and if they endanger public health and the environment, they should be regulated. The second happened in the state of California when a freshman, a senator, Fred Pavley, successfully introduced a bill to require cars to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and soon thereafter, 13 other states adopted the California program. And the third driver was the near collapse of the auto industry in 2008, when gasoline prices reached above $4 a gallon, uh, car sales were diving, but more important, uh, SUV sales were going down significantly. And clearly, uh, Chrysler and GM uh, were looking for a government bailout to avoid bankruptcy. The industry was just not ready for the products that the consumer was looking when the gasoline prices went to $4 a gallon. So we needed all these three elements, at least to be in place for the first action to, re to regulate um, carbon emissions and obviously the support of the White House. 
So under President Obama, we took two regulatory actions, one in 2010, the other one in 2012, that set the pathway and the lead time for companies to invest and reduce carbon emissions from new cars from, 20, oops, from 2012 to 2025. Today, these regulations are driving more innovation and faster adoption of advanced technologies. If you visit dealerships across the country, you're going to see clean, smart technologies, innovations that were unmanageable. You could not imagine them in mass production vehicles a decade or two ago. There are already 76 alternative powertrain vehicles in the United States. And in addition to the explosion of available hybrids and electrics, uh, you, it's amazing. 10 years ago, we would not have expected that Ford would be replacing um, steel with an aluminum body for the F-150. The Chevrolet Volt provides a great solution for people that do urban driving. Uh, I own a Volt, and I just turned it back to get my second Volt. And I checked the gates, and the car I turned into showed 200 miles per gallon, driving it for 42 months. BMW i, uh, who would expect that we're going to have a car that not only is made from carbon fiber, but it's using clean hydro energy to produce that fiber. And who can say anything about the Tesla as a real revolutionary electric vehicle that not only has captured the imagination of its customers, but the imagination of its competitors worldwide. Uh, and clearly, it's a car that can beat probably the Porsche on, on, on a racetrack while getting 100 miles per gallon. In short, the race to fill the markets created by these regulations has set off a revolution on clean car technology. But the work is not done, and countries, including the US and, and other countries, must continue their efforts before beyond 2025. We need to continue the regulatory efforts without stopping a year or two years. There is an urgency to continue from 20, 2026 to 2050 timeframe. Uh, according to the scientific consensus, um, and unfortunately some in our US Congress do not believe the science, uh, but the majority of, of people believe in the scientific consensus on climate change. Globally, we must reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% in 2050 from the 2005 levels. The translation for cars, by mid of the century, all cars should be 180 miles per gallon on cafe space and should be emitting zero carbon pollution. Clearly, this is a bold target, but technically, it is within reach. So the ideal future car fleet would be a mixture of electric vehicles powered by clean and renewable grid electricity, fuel cell electric vehicles power, powered by hydrogen made from renewable sources, and electric hybrids using cellulose low carbon fuels. Uh, there are three drivers that I want to briefly mention that I believe will lead us to the car of the future. The first, um, and it was mentioned earlier, is the growth of mega cities and the need to address air pollution, congestion, and economic growth. In 1950, the greater New York, uh, New York area was the world's only mega city with 10 million people. Today, we have 23 of those cities. And in 10 years, there will be 37, mostly in developing countries. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that 7 million deaths happen annually from air pollution. Just imagine. And about 2.6 million of those deaths are in, in, in Asia. In addition to the health crisis, cities, uh, it costs cities an enormous amount of lost worker productivity and health care. Mega cities across the planet, from Beijing to London, are taking actions to reduce air pollution from cars. The second is the convergence of climate action for automobiles. 70% of new cars sold today come from markets across the planet that have some form of fuel economy and or greenhouse gas targets. And those targets will converge in 2025 timeframe. And finally, the social impacts of connected living and working. Connected living has already changed the way people communicate and interact with each other. Instead of driving to work, we telecommute. I know I do that these days. Uh, I don't try 
to avoid to go downtown Washington. Instead of going out with friends or family, my daughters are Instagramming photos of food and beer, um, and I'm one of their followers. Uh, younger people in the US and Europe are less likely to have a driver's license or want to own a car. When my oldest daughter uh, turned 16, uh, every day, seriously, would ask me, what car, which one of my cars and my husband's cars she would, she would drive? Today she doesn't want to drive a car. Finally, connected living uh, will impact the future of transportation in two ways. I believe the first is technological. The development of affordable, semi-autonomous and driverless cars will provide the ultimate on-demand service. And the other change is social. If the global spread of connected living encourages more and more people to use on-demand and share vehicles instead of owning their own cars, the number of cars on the road could decrease rapidly, and so would air pollution. Future cars will have to contribute to lower carbon footprint on our uh, uh, urban centers and megacities. They will need to plug into an increasingly connected world, and there will be mobility solutions that offer trans uh, transport freedom. On the top of that, obviously, they will have to excite consumers. Climate change is the most daunting task facing the planet today. But I believe for the transportation sector, it also opens all sorts of possibilities. And there are so many developments underway to mention, from the driverless Google car to use additive manufacturing solution that may redefine uh, the words build your own car. As cars become personal operating systems like smartphones, will Silicon Valley players like Google will be more important in transportation than traditional car companies by the mid of century? Is Apple going to build an iCar or develop an iLife solution that integrates personal mobility, living, and energy? There are many, many questions we will clearly see answer in time. And also is giving us all the answers, I believe is going to be the new generation, the existing new generation of engineers, who like the engineers of ages past will come once again, will help on overcome the challenges with the very exciting solutions that we could not have imagined uh, years ago. There are some of the most exciting times in the automotive engineering. I don't know how many of you are engineers. I'm an engineer, and the only thing I wish is that I was younger so I could come back and work with the engineers to address uh, these exciting times that we're living in this country and the planet as a whole. Thank you. So the future is now.